Howdy from Oklahoma, all you 350 Legend fans. I haven't forgotten about you, and I've been doing some tests here in the background. We'll be able to hopefully show some of these pretty soon here, actually live out at the range. But uh, there are some things that I wanted to mention to you that I think might help a little bit. Uh, first off, the rifle that I've been testing, the CMMG Resolute. Love it. Wonderful. Very lightweight. And uh, just with all the rounds that I've been putting through this, I still very highly recommend it. That little muzzle brake also does a pretty good job of uh, taming recoil on here. US Optics TS6X, great choice. First focal plane reticle. Uh, it has a, a great little reticle that allows you to actually deal with your drops, which is actually very important with 350 Legend. Um, just a crosshair is gonna, I guess, do okay for you as long as you kind of know what distances you're dealing with. But uh, since this one does kind of drop like a, a brick at, as you start to stretch some of those distances out, it's nice to be able to uh, compensate for uh, your, your kind of trajectory, uh, especially if you take that 400 yard shot. You're going to have plenty of energy at 400 yards for uh, a lot of game, but uh, yeah, you might just have a little bit more of a tricky time getting on target and that scope's going to do the job. Now, when it comes to hand loading, guys, uh, there are a couple of things that I'd like to point out. Some strange things that have happened on the, the road here, and maybe some little tips and tricks that I can throw out for you. As you can see, I'm actually working up some uh, hand loads here in the background. I've done some Satterley tests with all kinds of uh, weird and wacky bullets you guys asked for. Uh, so, for example, we'll, we'll go through these in uh, kind of order of interest. Uh, first off, I have Hornady XTP. We had a lot of folks ask to see uh, the 9mm 147 grain bullet especially, and then some folks wanted to see the 158 grain uh, 357 diameter bullet. And so I have tested both of these. Uh, these actually had some real problems uh, in this rifle. They fired just fine. Um, they weren't particularly accurate, but the big deal was that they wouldn't feed. Uh, they kept, it has kind of a wide nose. It's a pretty big um, tip on there. And so they were just slamming into the front of the magazine. And in some cases, you know, kind of shoving the bullet back in there. Um, so these are ones that I'm not going to recommend for an AR style rifle. Uh, if you have a semi-automatic and it works for you, uh, please let people know maybe if you did something a little bit different. I had a suspicion, and I might follow this up here in a bit if I can uh, find the time to do it, but I had a suspicion that if I loaded these bullets out a little bit farther, uh, if I didn't have them sunk quite so deep into the case that they might have fed a little bit better. It seems like if you have a little bit of a longer run, sometimes they pick up a little better when they're struck by the bolt carrier. Um, so I might give that a shot. I'm not expecting great things just because the tip is so wide. It has a very wide miplat and uh, some of those just didn't do very well. I will, however, since many of you guys are bolt action shooters and you're gonna wanna see what the terminal effects might be like anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and cook some of these up and I'll just hand load them into the rifle and I'll shoot them into gel so you can see what kind of damage they do. I'm expecting good things on that front. The next really interesting bullets are these right here, Lehigh Defense. We had a bunch of people ask about seeing the, uh, the Lehigh XDs. These are the ones that have that uh, kind of cross front or the X kind of cut in there. And these seem to do a really good job cutting through uh, flesh, cutting through animals, uh, cutting through ballistics gel and making quite a big mess despite the fact that it doesn't have a hollow cavity and these don't deform at all when they hit. It kind of it's an interesting little thing where these little, it's like a little propeller of doom that it, it sort of makes small cuts into the gel or whatever it is. And then those little uh, divots that are cut in there just create a massive temporary wound cavity that continues the cut out in all directions. And it seems to cause a very devastating wound. So we will be uh, showing these in gel. But when it comes to getting these on target and figuring out how they run in the rifle, I've been very impressed. This is the 118 grain. We also have the, uh, the 90 right here. And yes, uh, like other folks have found, with that 90 grain bullet, I was able to get my hand load over 3,000 feet per second. It actually started out that way, even at relatively low pressures. Uh, this is one that definitely will go out the barrel, even at 
you know, anywhere from that, that low pressure, kind of minimum load up to maximum load, it's going to be over 3,000 feet per second. And I cannot wait to see what it can do to gel. This is going to be really fun. The 118 is moving out pretty fast as well. As you can see, you know, it's, it's heavier, of course, and there's less of a powder charge behind it. But uh, this is one that I think is going to be very effective. But when it came to hand loading for accuracy, there were a couple of things that I, I've been running into. So we'll talk about this first and then we'll come back to the bullet. The, uh, the brass that you see right here, this, uh, I actually have a mix. I have some Starline, I have some, uh, some Winchester, some Federal, and uh, some from Browning. I bet it's the same as the Winchester. But uh, there is a little bit of a difference in the case mouth on some of these. Starline set up their brass specifically, and I, I'll point you toward a, an older video where I showed how precise it is. Starline makes nutty brass. This stuff is match ready, um, extremely precise, not only in terms of length and how they cut it, but just how much water these can hold. The capacity is just identical from one to the next, almost identical. Uh, and measuring these on the scale, they do a fantastic job. And that's what helps to create a lot of the accuracy that I'm getting from some of my modern loads. But uh, Starline does make their brass with a little bit of a thinner case mouth so that folks that are setting their rifles up for 358 Legend, which is just 350 Legend that can handle uh, a 358 diameter bullet, um, uh, so it can actually accommodate that. So it's a little bit thinner at the case mouth. And this can lead to some, uh, some neck tension issues. And I can show you a couple of ways to mitigate that. So this is a piece of Starline brass right here. And I have a 355 diameter bullet. This is just factory resized, and I didn't set this up beforehand. I just grabbed one here. But you can see that even factory sized, okay, I can just barely start to push the bullet into there. If you are running a 355 diameter bullet, I recommend that, especially if you're using the Starline brass, don't flare the neck. Uh, don't, don't do it at all, unless you end up crushing one. But since this can pretty well seat right in there, I can just push the bullet in, and that should get me decent neck tension. If I were to flare this, and I have tested this myself, um, then I'm gonna have to crimp it in order to keep the bullet in place. There's not enough neck tension uh, to keep it in place. And I can't really set up the bullet seating die to squish things back down uh, small enough to get things in place. So yeah, don't neck flare if you're gonna use a 355. If you are using a 357, there are a couple of tips that I can uh, send your way. First off, you will need to flare the mouth on any of the brass that you see back here, Starline, Federal, uh, if you don't, you're going to end up crushing the case, and I've done this a couple of times already. Uh, the, the brass up here on 350 Legend is very thin no matter what the manufacturer is, um, and it is pretty easy to squash. So yeah, do just neck flare it as little as you need to in order to get that bullet seated in there and then push it in, and you might get enough neck tension that way. But in certain cases, uh, you're going to need to do a, a crimp. Use that Lee crimper. It works really well. And I heard that RCBS also changed theirs to a taper crimp as well. Uh, so you don't get any of those pressure spikes that we talked about in the past. Uh, but yeah, use the Lee collet crimper or use that RCBS. And then you, you should be cooking. That should work out really well. However, if you do end up needing to crimp, uh, please, whatever powder charge you've been working with, you're going to have to back it off by probably 10%. That's what I've been working with here in the background, and that has been working out really well for me. If I ever needed to crimp, if I was coming from quick load, trying to figure out uh, how much powder to put in there and what bullet seating and all that, um, yeah, I was backing off my, my, my minimum and my maximum by an extra 10%, and that's been working out really well. Also, if you are using a one, uh, or excuse me, a 357 diameter bullet, one of these bigger ones, uh, whatever powder charge quick load comes up with, or uh, unless you see a specific load out there for 357, uh, it, you're probably going to have to back it off by 10% as well. Uh, in my case, if I did both, like I had a 158 grain XTP that. Uh, 
is you know a 357 diameter bullet and is one that needs crimp. Uh, this is one that I backed off by a full 15% and the results were great. I didn't get into overpressure. Everything seemed to be just running as it should. With all that in mind, now we come back to the Lehigh Defense bullets. Um, the, the 90 grain, it's going to take me a little bit to figure out exactly which one I want to use. This one uh, wasn't turning in the most accurate looking stuff on the, the paper, but the 118 grain, and again, I, I crimped both of these to help keep them into the case. This one turned in some spectacular results that you can see right back up here on the wall. This might not look so great. Each of these is a different powder charge separated by 0.3 grains of powder. And you can see that they're just kind of splattering all over the place, except that hole right there is three shots. This has definitely found its little uh, moment of where it works. You can see that everything else is a mess. You know, vertically, maybe it's not so bad and I could probably, you know, pick something else out of here but this is definitely the good stuff right here. And looking at the velocities on the chart, the velocities are a little bit wonky, but it's indicating to me that this is the powder charge that I'm after. I can pick something in this range and it's gonna turn in that. In the past, I have never gotten good results with crimping, ever. Crimping always ruins my, uh, my hand loads. It makes them just kind of shoot all over the place. I've tried this with 223, I think with 7mm 08, 308. Uh, it just kind of turns everything to garbage. And I can see now that actually it may have its place uh, just with that little three shot group right there. We're gonna see what accuracy and what kind of hits we can get on gel with that. It's going to be some good fun. We have one more Lehigh defense bullet, and that is the controlled fracturing bullet right here. This is a 105 grain, and I was really excited to see how this might perform in 350 Legend. It has those three pedals that when it hits, they break off and it kind of create a, their own little wound cavities flying off at angles. And then you have the base continuing forward, and it looks like it makes quite a bit of a mess, you know, based on some of the videos that I've seen before but this didn't really work for 350 Legend, and I'll, I'll kind of point out why. If you have a bolt action, you'll be able to get some performance out of it, but uh, you might want to head in the direction of the XDs instead, based on what I'm about to tell you. The, uh, the CF has a limited speed, so this is one that they recommend it needs to be between 750 and 2,000 feet per second. So I went into quick load, I figured out what kind of powder charge is gonna get me that speed, and I worked some of these up, and there were just immediately some issues. Um, it, it, it doesn't produce enough power for me to be able to cycle the bolt, so it's really not all that useful. Uh, I'll put the, the max load, I'll just put it here on the screen so you can see what the, uh, the max charge is in order to hit that speed. I think what happens and why they recommend this is that uh, if you go any faster, remember it's gonna make that bullet spin faster, and it's probably just gonna make those uh, chunks of copper peel off all by themselves as they fly through the air. Not the best idea. Uh, so I think that's why they are limiting this to only 2,000 feet per second. But yeah, if you do want to try them in, uh, in your 350 Legend bolt action rifle, yeah, I've got the, that set up right here and you can uh, give it a try. It's not, you know, dangerous or anything. It's just fine, but uh, it's just kind of low power. Thanks a lot, you guys, for watching. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you to CMMG for sending the rifle for me to continue to test, and hopefully we can test it on swine flesh uh, sometime here in the future. We got some piggy problems down south that we need to deal with, and uh, hopefully we can get out there and have some fun and uh, be able to actually test this out in the real world. I've been hearing from some of you guys that uh, you've been out doing hog hunting with it, and this... Uh, the 350 Legend has been working very well. I've heard from deer hunters especially, too. Uh, they say that it has proven to be very effective with some of those, um, uh, the factory loads that we've tested, like the, uh, uh, we had folks talking about the, the XTP, I think it's called, or XP, the, um, uh, the deer season from Winchester. Folks have been talking about that one. And all those really should be quite effective. So yeah, thank you hunters and shooters for telling me how this has been running for you. Uh, hopefully we can continue to build this knowledge and figure out what all we can do with 350 Legend and make this 
it, it's already a very effective cartridge, but I think we can continue to grow this and make it into something that uh, is even more effective in the future. But thank you to everybody that makes these videos possible, especially the patrons of the Destructive Arts out on Patreon. Uh, we have all kinds of folks like the Sportsman's Guide and Stan and Mary at the 338 Lapua Magnum level. We have Joseph Davis, Peter. We have Mr. No Name and Howard at the 300 Win Mag level and just a gob of other folks that are chipping in a buck or two a month. Every little bit adds up and helps me to get better audio, better video, better lights and uh, be able to produce more of this stuff out in the field. Thanks a bunch of you guys, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to like, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Even if you didn't like this particular content, go ahead and subscribe. There's probably something coming that's more up your alley. Check out this playlist right here. This is going to have videos in a similar vein to what you just watched. These two videos we cherry picked for you. And finally, The Social Regressive is on Patreon. So, you can become a patron of the Destructive Arts and earn some goodies while helping us to provide high-quality videos just by kicking us a few bucks a month. Thanks a bunch for your patronage.